Welcome back to your Pig Trail Show. Will Moclair alongside Kevin McPherson, who we've got on the phone today for our Hog Hoops Report. Kevin, what a week of Arkansas basketball taking down UNCG and then a decisive win over OU yesterday. Let's start with that UNG, UNGC game. That was, it was a nail biter up there in the front end. A lot of Hogs uh, having a slow start to that one, but coming through in the end, what would you see there? Well, you know, the big news coming out of that game was not like, you know, aside from Arkansas winning was the loss of Trevor in Brazil. He went down at the 730 mark left in the first half. Um, he played nine minutes, and we know that he was lost for the season. It was reported a day later to an ACL tear, which will have to be surgically rep repaired. Yeah. Uh, that procedure will be done, Will, uh, later this month. So that's a big loss because Arkansas, I've said it, I, I wrote about it a couple of weeks ago, and it continues to prove out Arkansas has got an elite backcourt arguably the best in college basketball. I think it's the best in the SEC. And so you could live, you, you could, you could win games while you waited on Nick Smith Jr. and why he was out for six games. On the front line, Arkansas really had one piece that I thought that had a chance to be elite this season and at times was sh showing flashes of that. And that was Brazil because of his <laughs> physical uniqueness, you know, 6'10", 7'4", wingspan, jumps out of the gym, and then his skill level for a guy with his physical attributes, when you put it all together, you know, some fans at Arkansas called him a unicorn, but I thought, you know, he's definitely one of the top players. Uh, when you look around the country, not just the SEC, Melsman called him one of the top five talents, best talents in the SEC. So that was probably a true statement. So you lose him. Not only that, but you're losing the game for most of the game against Greensboro and Arkansas had to out physical, out grind. It was ugly. It was down in the mud. Uh, and the Razorbacks get it done. You know, it wasn't, you know, Ricky Council, the leading scorer on the team, had an off night for him. Only game this season where he failed to reach double figures, but Arkansas was outstanding at the free throw line. Nick Smith Jr. stepped up with 22 points in his second uh, his second start as a Razorback and only his third game, so he led the team there. Uh, so Arkansas gets it done like it typically gets things done. Uh, but it was a game where Makai Mitchell, who's been a regular starter, stepped up and had a double-double, 13 points, 14 rebounds. Uh, four blocks in that game and a couple of steals and, you know, played an outstanding game on the front line. So he picked up that slack. Uh, but, you know, there's going to – when I say that, that Brazil's uh, not the kind of guy that you can replicate, it's going to be – take more than one. It's going to be a committee on that front line, I think. And we've seen what guys like Kamani Johnson can do to help the team. But outside of Makai Mitchell against Greensboro, there were still some question marks there. I thought Arkansas – now we talk about the big game of the week. Obviously, Oklahoma's a high major opponent. It's a team you had a revenge factor coming into this game. But you also had maybe a bigger question is now that you know you're beginning a game that when Brazil's not going to be available from here on out, how do guys respond? And I thought a starter, we go back to that starting lineup. You, you know, Mitchell again had a good game. We're going to get more into that. But I thought it was Jordan Walsh. He, he set a tone early. Uh, very active defensively with his length and quickness. Uh, gets an early block. They, they may have called it a steal or a deflection, but it looked like a block to me. And Arkansas gets out in transition, and Nick Smith uh, Jr. finishes shortly after that. Wall steps up and knocks down the first of two threes. When you look at the dust settling, he hits a big three late um, in the game where Arkansas was in a stretch where OU was trying to make a comeback. And in between there, he was just a warrior on the offensive glass getting – tight situations around the basket where it was crowded and he went up above everybody to finish, you know, put the ball in. So I thought when you look at Jordan Walsh defensively, there was another play on an inbounds where he deflects a pass, gets it, races out after the steal uh, to, to finish with a dunk in transition. And so he checked about every box you would want him to check and playing within his strengths to be a guy that helps offset that loss. And he brings some similar qualities to Brazil. He's not as tall, but they both have 7'3", seven, 7'4", seven, wingspan. He's got his own uh, brand of, of, of plus athleticism. And then he can stretch the floor, and he's at that 3-4 combo spot where he can help you in that 4 spot, which is what Brazil was. Brazil a stretch 4, Walsh more of a combo 3-4, and I think – we saw in this game where it was perfect with the rest of what Ar with the rest of Arkansas's lineup, mixing in another strong performance from Makai Mitchell, um, which with his ten points, four assists, uh, had led the team with six rebounds. So back to back games. You looked at last two games, Mitchell's averaging a double double. I think thirteen and a half points and ten rebounds, but he's also blocking shots and getting steals. Kamani Johnson comes in on that front line and helps fill that void again. It's by committee. 
But so I, I mentioned those three names. If Arkansas gets consistent play from those three within their roles, within the strengths of their games, it's not that they won't miss Trevor and Brazil, but with this elite backcourt, which we haven't even talked about yet, uh, Arkansas can still really control its own destiny, even without a talent like Brazil. And that's what happens uh, when you go back to recruiting in the offseason and the, la- the past recruiting cycle. When you bring in three five-stars and then you go hit the portal and you bring in two five-star, what I think are five-star talents in Brazil, and a name I haven't even mentioned yet, Ricky Council the fourth. How about a bounce back from him? We just talked about his season low, the prior game against Greensboro, 26 points. He and Nick Smith Jr., who had 21 points, I thought were really good offensively for a stretch in the first half where it seemed like, oh, you couldn't miss. And Arkansas just needed to figure out a way to at least trade blows and make shots and keep itself within a footprint of a chance to get back in that game. And that's what they did. They fell behind by nine early. No shocker there. I, told, I, I compared Arkansas on last week's show to a – to one of those boxing styles where you just kind of some of those early rounds, you wonder what's going on and you're losing some of those rounds. And then you, you start to dominate in the, in the middle to the championship round. And once again, that was the formula. Arkansas hung in and they cooled Oklahoma down. It was a team that was shooting over 76% from the field uh, starting 13 of 17 in this game. And Arkansas cooled that team down, even though OU finishes at 57%, there was a 20% difference there from how it started. Uh, that was a cooling down throughout the game, and a lot of that had to do with Arkansas blue collar diving, creating loose balls, diving on the floor to win those battles, getting steals, blocking shots. Arkansas, ten steals, five block shots compared to OU's five steals and one block. I thought that was a big difference. Arkansas fifty-eight to forty-four in the paint. Uh, so the blue collar stuff around the basket. Arkansas doubles up OU at the free throw line, fourteen of nineteen versus seven of nine. Uh, so everywhere that Arkansas thinks of itself as, as a strength in its game. Blue-collar basketball, it was better. And OU, who keeps scores down low and has held some really good teams in check and shoots at a high level, Arkansas didn't take everything away. OU still finishes 57%, but guess what? Arkansas, who's not always that efficient, shoots 59%. So they actually were better shooting the ball on top of all those other things I just said. They checked the boxes and were better. And that's how you take – a nine-point advantage and turn it into a 10-point win. Arkansas had double-digit leads for most of that second half, Will, and built their lead a couple of times to 16 points. So, yeah, you lost by 22 a year ago. You didn't exactly equal out the difference on the margin there. So what? Arkansas was the better team, the more dominant team. And I look at a guy like that, I haven't even mentioned Anthony Black, that continues to me to be that guy sort of in a Jalen Williams last year role that just puts – you feel more at ease uh, with him running things and being a part of what's going on. I mean, eight points, four, four, perfect from the field, you know, uh, five assists. He and Ricky council shared the lead for the team lead on that uh, with five assists, but he had four rebounds, a couple of steals, a block. He did have five turnovers, but again, I think he plays the right way He gets everybody involved. And you, you look, when you look back on a game, you're remiss if you don't talk about, what Anthony Black brings to the floor and some of the u- uniqueness on defense as well. And I just think when I look at again at that backcourt and then Devo Davis also making big contributions yesterday, it's the best basketball ba- backcourt in, in, in the SEC uh, basketball uh, in 22-23, in my opinion. It's still early. That's what I see. And at, at some point, Will, I think we may look back on this and say this might have been the best backcourt in all of college basketball. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that statement. I'm happy that you mentioned Debo there because I feel like he really did have an impact defensively. Obviously, Kamani in that conversation as well, but it's exciting to see what this team will do. TB will be seriously missed, and there's really nobody who's going to replace that guy one-on-one, but it's nice to see that the committee stepped up, Walsh, all of the guys that you mentioned, to create one whole player. And again, it'll it'll be interesting to see the way that this develops, especially there in the backcourt. One thing that I think Hog fans are very interested in right now is Nick Smith Jr. wobbling off the court there in the fourth quarter. It doesn't seem like things are too serious. It was mentioned there in the press conference there at the end. What what are you hearing on this front? I know that it's mostly rumors at this point, but are you concerned? Well, you're always concerned when a guy, I mean, you know, he did, you know, the, the European tour, he tweaked the knee, didn't play the rest of the final game when it happened. And that was early, you know, sometime in the second quarter, he didn't come back. When they returned to Fayetteville, he didn't practice for a while. He was going through, uh, you know, management at that time, dealing with the knee. Um, And so 
you know, then we see him get through preseason fine. And then, and then, you know, between the last preseason game at Texas and the season opener, we learn that he's going to be going through some more of the precautionary management stuff. Um, so we don't know the severity of things, but anytime someone's kind of been up and down, back and forth, dealing with a knee. Now I don't have any specifics on what brought him off the floor. He took himself off the floor with about five or so minutes left in the game uh, on a play where he was attempting to drive. He backed it out and you could see him limp a little bit. So I can make assumptions and, and speculate when I would think that it, it might be related to the knee uh, in a similar way that to what he's already gone through with it. That seems, you know, you know, on a, on a, on a you know, on a scale of other possibilities, that seems the what, is most likely initially I was told nothing specific about what was hurt, but that it wasn't a big deal. But again, I think it's always a big deal. It, it depends on what your opinion uh, definition of that is. Uh, it may not be a situation that's required surgery. Obviously if it was and he, and, and if he was going to have a surgery, they, he probably wouldn't be playing if it was something like that. Um, you know, so now I'm kind of going down a rabbit hole, uh, but, it, but you know, some fans think, well, if you're going through precautionary me measures and you're not playing, well, that's serious. Uh, but you don't want a situation to get serious, and that's why you do those things. So we need to see how this plays out. Uh, we need to see, you know, if, if he – you know, Arkansas has a full week between games uh, when they play Bradley in North Little Rock on Saturday uh, this this coming week weekend. And, you know, that's time for someone to rest and, and maybe figure out what's going on there, maybe – you know, we'll learn in the next few days probably if there's anything more to it uh, where he's going to miss time. But f from what I was initially told, that, that you know, what I was hearing is that that's not – that there's not going to be an issue that he's okay, but we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. I was just pulling it up here. He tweeted after the game, Woo Pig Suey, see you in Little Rock, couple emojis there. Seems like a positive tweet. I don't think he would have tweeted that if it wasn't something super serious. Again, we're not doctors. We're just reading into the situation. Hopefully, hopefully all is going the direction that it needs to, but I don't think Hawk fans need to be too concerned. You mentioned well, there that we've got a week there between between games. So you think that'll be beneficial for everybody besides Nick Smith Jr.? Obviously, that knee getting a little bit of rest there. Yeah, this is the formula every year in December. December is the weirdest month of the season when you talk about games because you, you you play some games. You, you know, November is a little bit heavier on the schedule. But you've got finals, you've got uh, the break coming up, mid, you know, the, the break between semesters. Um, and so you've got games kind of spread out like this. And so Eric Melsman prefers to, you know, to keep going. Uh, so in some ways, uh, from that standpoint, it's not his preference. But you're, you're, you're dealing with this is a team that only played all together healthy once. And right now, for all of us, uh, Nick Smith Jr., who didn't finish that game, by the way, there's a question mark on top of just losing Brazil. So I think, in, you know, maybe it, maybe this time off helps you resolve those things uh, to move forward, and it gives you enough time to prepare uh, if you're going to be without another player. And, again, uh, you know, the more we talk about that, the more it sounds like I'm trying to telegraph that, that, that someone's going to miss a game. No, I'm not. I'm just saying we've seen it play out this year. Arkansas has been healthy and at full strength one game, and that will only be one game because Brazil, as we know, won't be back. Uh, so we just, but I do think because of those reasons, Will, it's probably a good thing for this team to have that much time between games uh, to, to rest up, figure things out. And if they have to move forward a little differently than they did in the previous game, there's still enough firepower in that lineup uh, to, 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 do, to do just fine in December. Uh, now, at the end of the month, you go on the road for your first SEC game. That's at the end of December. And certainly Arkansas is going to want to be as fully healthy as possible. I mean, you want that for every game, but certainly when you get an SEC play, you want to be, you, you want all hands on deck, uh, you know, relative to what's still available to you for the rest of the season. So there's plenty of time to sort through some of this other stuff before the end of the month. I know it comes up pretty fast, but again, Arkansas plays Bradley. They'll have one more game against UNC Asheville at home in Fayetteville before they get in that SEC game. Uh, so, you know, we're 18 days away from that opener against LSU with only two games in between. So I think that time in between actually helps Arkansas having fewer games because of some of the question marks with with uh, with injuries and health. Yeah, absolutely. That one at LSU, that's definitely going to be an exciting one. Kevin, we always like to talk pro hogs as well. We've had a lot of talk about Bobby. What are you seeing from him this week and other pro hogs? Yeah, I mean, Bobby – 
continues to average a double double. He's one of only eleven players in the NBA to do that. Uh, he's he's been the top three or four when you look at total double doubles on the season. Um, and his efficiency is, you know, among, you know, when you look at his shooting efficiency uh, from the field, it's it's slightly above where it was a season ago uh, and a little bit below where it was two years ago when he helped the Bucks win a title. Three-point shooting is down just a little bit. But I think when I look at Bobby, his value when, when, when he's as a six-man, when he's got those career-high averages, rebounds over 10 now, he's never been – a double digit rebounder on average. And we're over, we're more than a quarter of the way through the season. He's also averaging a career high 2.3 assists. That may not sound like a lot, uh, but for a guy that's playing his, you know, his level of minutes between 25 and 27 minutes a game. Um, and, and you see that increased production because he's always been a guy that could score and be a good, a good, you know, fourth or fifth option as a score, sometimes third option. Uh, but he's reliable in these other areas as well. And so he's, He's late, raised the level of his game. Again, averaging a double-double, I think he's the only reserve uh, that's doing that. And so I think he's po- po- positioning himself, Will, for serious six-man-of-the-year consideration if he's not the front-runner. I think he probably should be. Maybe I'm a little biased, but I, lo- I watch a lot of basketball. I think Blake Griffin's in that post. conversation too now. What's that? <laughs> not to make this a Celtics talk, but I think Blake Griffin's in there too, maybe. Maybe not. Not that I'm not pulling <laughs> for Bobby. Yeah, I mean, there's other guys that are going to be talked about. Malik Monk, who's in Arkansas and uh, with oh, yeah. the Sacramento yeah. Kings, who have been who have a winning record right now. He's he's been a guy that's getting some chatter. Uh, th- th- I just don't. I, th- Bobby has so many qualities that impact winning. Um, and again, it's it's almost unheard of for a guy playing his minutes to be averaging the numbers he is with the kind of star level guys ahead of him. When you talk about pecking order, and so uh, for him to rise up and and you know, have more double doubles than his teammate Giannis does, who's in the conversation every year for MVP, uh, speaks a lot to the value that Bobby brings. There's other guys, of course, that are that are in that conversation, and it's still early enough in the season where you can't just you know hand over any recognition to Bobby as Sixth Man of the Year. I just think he's the probably, you know, when I look at everything, I think he should probably be leading in that conversation. But there's other pro hogs, you know, right now, you know, Isaiah Joe had a big week with the Oklahoma City Thunder in terms of his role continues to increase. Last night, 12 points, 4 of 7 shooting. It was a road loss against the number one defense in the NBA. But he played 19 minutes, 4 of 7 from the field, 3 of 6 from 3, had 3 rebounds, a couple of steals and assists. But it's his box score plus minus. Every game it seems like he's leads the team. He was led the team last night with a box plus 8 in a game they lost by 8. So when he's on the floor – He's making winning, play, winning plays, and when, when you look at him offensively, he's a less is more guy. There's so many guys that dribble and hunt and probe. He's a guy that gets quick into his stuff, man, quick release on catch and shoot. He doesn't dribble a lot to get into a shot. He makes the right pass at the right time, and then he's a very good defender, underrated there, I think. Good team defender, but also just plays the game with – without taking a lot of gambling risks and getting out of position. And so it makes him effective at both ends. And it's why that box score plus minus is always on the positive side. Here's a guy that coming into the week was in the top 20 in the NBA in true shooting percentage at over, I think it was 67 or so percent. Uh, He's in the top 50 in the NBA in player efficiency rating. And then we move over to Daniel Gafford, who didn't have a big night last night, didn't have one of his better games. But in the last few games, his roles increased. His minutes have gone up. You know, he had a double-double. Uh, he had one of the best dunks I've seen, maybe the dunk of the year, playing against the Lakers in a game he had 19 points a season high. And then he had another double-digit game after that, 10 points. So in his fourth season, Daniel Gafford, the big man from El Dorado, uh, is showing flashes of a guy now that he's in a reserve role, uh, still showing flashes is a guy that brings value into a top two rotation and, and down the line still to me projects as a starter for somebody. So you got a lot of pro hogs last night, Moses Moody in a big showdown on ABC TV nationally televised. Uh, you had uh, Golden State and Boston, you know, that was the NBA finals last year. Golden State won the last four games to win that series four to two. I was reliving uh, a nightmare Moody was last in that night. Top nine rotate. Huh? I said I was reliving a nightmare last night. I, okay, I know you're 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 the you're you're a New Englander. I get that, and, and what we have to have these conversations if we're talking pro hogs. I mean Moses Moody. Was no, I know, I know, I know. We've got to do it. it. It was great to see. It was great to see Moody. It really, really was. But wow, that Golden State team—they are dangerous. 
Yeah, but Boston, you know, came into that with the best record in the NBA, still has the best record in the NBA after that loss, and they're playing on the road. And, uh, you know, uh, Golden State's not been quite itself, not as good defensively. M- Moody has been in and out of the rotation last night, 12 minutes, and he was, uh, you know, that was eighth in minutes, and he played in every quarter. So, um, you know, and then he finishes with two points and, a, and five rebounds. And so he, he did some good things to help in that, help in that cause. But, uh, you know, Boston now has the same amount of losses as, as Portis and Milwaukee, but but they played more games. So they got two more wins, still the best record in the NBA. So you will sleep gently and well tonight, good sir, knowing that. Oh, it really has been watched. It's been a great NBA season. It's been great to watch Bobby, all the other guys, Moody, Gamper, Joe, obviously, Kevin. It's always great talking as well to you, man. We were so much fun, but we've got to go to break. So much more Pig Trail Show coming up.